Welcome to Breaking Down Bergman. I'm David Friend. And I'm Sonia Strumban. And we're looking at the right. Yeah. You know, so can we just talk a little bit about the whole thing? A number, or whatever you want to call it, for a pawfund or a pawfund. Fy väl, men jag tycker ni är löjlig med förbannade självkänsla. En underklassig nyfikenhet. En taktlöshet. En brist på bildning och mänsklig medkänsla. Vet ni vad jag upptäckt? Ni är inte renliga, Abramsson. Jag tror det brister i den intima hygienen. Under den friska doften av ett rakvatten står den tydlig och dör av sur, otvättad fetma. Ni byter säkert skjorta varje dag. Men ovanför den bländvita kragen jag ser jag en fullt påtaglig skitrand. Era naglar är inte särskilt rena. Jag föraktar er. Jag föraktar er. Tycker ni är obegripligt löjlig er beskäftighet. Det känns inte illa att få frottera sig mot tre världsartister. Att få stå i tidningen med foto och jämnöjd med oss. Det känns inte illa att få plåga oss med idiotiska och förutmjukande frågor. Och under förebärande av hygglighet och diskretion. Att knäppa ner våra byxor och smiska oss lite. Jag tänker in min advokat kräva en domare på min nivå. Ni har ingen förutsättning att förstå eller bedöma vad vi gjort. Ni är en lågsinnad dum, stackare. Nu har jag sagt vad jag burit på. Nu kan du bura in mig. För missfirmelse eller vad det heter. In some ways I feel like The Right is a very unique film for this period in Bergman's career. Bergman was working with the Royal Dramatic Theatre and he had been having some successes but there were a lot of criticisms coming from outsiders and I feel like The Right was sort of a channeling of a bit of that aggression that he may have had uh, internally um, into these characters that he made in the story of The Right. This is a TV movie which we've seen several of them before in his filmography but we haven't had access to them. A lot of them were locked mm -hmm. in vaults and we've talked about that many times. This gave us a glimpse into the television version of Bergman. I feel like the format of this film lacks air, you know? It's, it's, it's smaller, it's boxed in. Claustrophobic. Yeah, a little bit. It kind of is almost reminiscent of Brink of Life. Mm -hmm. where also it's a, it's very um like it's contained to a few sets and you can very obviously tell that they're sets there isn't that kind of freedom of nature or freedom of movement in the characters Bergman has a reputation for that sort of claustrophobic feel and sort of embracing the close up more than a lot of other directors and I mean, we've seen that in his other films, but I felt like the right was a more uh, more emphasized than usual. And, and you mentioned Brink of Life, which was a film that he made after a succession of TV movies. Mm -hmm. um, and the right, I think, gives us a glimpse into really what the TV persona of Bergman was. And I guess we can sort of weigh whether it was any different than the cinematic persona of Bergman. But the other thing that I noticed about it that was interesting was that it seems to marry all the different approaches that he has of creating setting. So there is an element of the dramatic or the theatrical staging. And then there's also the cinematic perspective with some of the close-up shots. But then there is this kind of TV feel, as you are saying, by sort of the smallness of it, if you will. With television, you often assume that it's not a complex medium. But with this film, there's a, a danger of over-analyzing what is on the screen. Absolutely. Not, I don't want to give it credit for being overly complex in a great way. I'm not really sure that's what the right is. I, I tend to agree with you. I think you can almost fall into a trap of trying to overanalyze it because it just bubbles up with references. The unfortunate part of having so many things cluttering one film is that none of them really get worked out. And so I think they, they lose a lot of steam um, and just crowd each other. The themes that he revisits here sound very familiar. It's things from The Magician, from through a glass darkly, the silence. These were all things that we saw in the film Persona. Yeah, but not not like this. I mean, in Persona, they all came together and they all me made meaning. And when he referenced something, it had real value. Whereas here, they just kind of bubble up to the surface and, and expire, you mm -hmm. know? I, I don't feel like there's the kind of cohesion in the right that there is in Persona. I feel like a lot of the references that he's making are, they're almost random. Which is strange because Bergman creates 
uh, structure around the storytelling in this film that is very obvious and mm -hmm. it's, it's to the audience it's intentional the scenes are created in essentially acts right mm -hmm. and he's he's so specific down to the location of where everything happens but it actually works against the film in a lot of ways well and it's funny because on the one hand he's really specific about the setting mm -hmm. like a room or something like that but the whole film is taking place in a country that's unknown mm -hmm. once again so he it's like the the meta setting is unknown and then he gives you like this micro micro detail which is it's it's disorienting and there are so many unanswered questions mm -hmm. about the characters as well and the situation that they're in it's not just the country that's unknown it's sort of where they came from and where they're going in some ways or how they can even really coexist i mean these people are horrible to each other they're just horrible people <laughs> <laughs> one is a murderer another one is an adulterer you know a third one is a, some kind of subversive control freak um, and they're just this unholy trinity that you know is stuck in this small tiny environment and they keep harming each other it's very neurotic and bizarre it's so tempting to break down these characters mm -hmm. and sort of put them into little boxes the yeah. id the ego the super ego is something yeah. that i was sort of uh, i felt the need to do very early on in the film yeah. i don't really know if bergen was going for that but it, he certainly sort of encourages you you to to compartmentalize the structure of this film like and, he does. And I think it's a fair assumption to make that conclusion about the psychoanalytical parts because we've been dealing with psychology for the past few films um, and, and Freudian references have been made, so I don't think it's a leap. Psychoanalysis is really a form of scrutiny where you're trying to control a certain behavior and a reaction based on your psychological state. And in this film, these three characters are the three parts of the, of the ego, super ego, and the id are also being scrutinized in an attempt to control by authority. So the three actors who are traveling troop, which, yeah, we've never seen before, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, they run into some problems because of the performance that they're giving, because it has a very pornographic element. And so basically they come across a magistrate who wants to censor them and potentially make them pay a fine unless they change the performance. So the compromise that they come to is they basically have to do the performance in advance for him to judge whether it is significantly offensive um, and then charge him the fine or not. It sounds a lot like The Magician. It sure does. And like in The Magician, the audience, which in this case is the magistrate and the critic, the authority figure, um, through the performance they are somehow transformed and harmed in a way because they have been opposed to it before. So, like in the other films, here Bergman is again playing with that art versus authority paradigm. And, of course, because it's Bergman, and we know what he thinks of himself and what he thinks of his critics, art triumphs. The Right is quite a significant shift from shame, which in many ways was quite a literal film. And here, there's a lot of trouble grasping what, what is reality, what is created. And what is the psychosis of the characters? There are a lot of questionable moments, whether they actually happened or not. One of them is when Sebastian sets the hotel room on fire and the bed is burning and then suddenly the scene ends. And we don't really know if that actually happened, if it was in his head, and there's no further addressing of that matter later on. Did he survive with burns? Apparently not, but Bergman just ignores it and I think that really throws us off. And then again, later on in the film, there is a rape scene, or you think it's a rape scene, which I think I found very questionable because in one instance, you can see her removing her panties, which sort of suggests that it might not be. But again, Bergman doesn't really address it. The shots are very tight on the scenes. So you can't really tell what's going on. Mm -hmm. Clearly intentional, but very frustrating as a viewer. Yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, aside from those shots, which I think are meant to confuse, there's a lot of other shots just in the way that they're made and the way things jump from scene to scene that they're unfinished or they start from places that we didn't expect. And there's, there's little continuity in the film as a whole. I found as a viewer that this lack of clarity was incredibly frustrating. It, there was nothing redeeming about it. It just confused me and I couldn't come up with anything from it mm -hmm. to really gain any insight into the storyline. On the whole, I, I do agree with you. I think it was a challenging film from like an enjoyment perspective to watch and, and, and to retain something from it. Um, but there was one scene that I liked where I actually thought that the style that he was working on for this film and kind of the, the 
throwback references to other films and other themes. I thought in this one particular scene that actually worked quite well. And that was the dressing room scene where Winkleman confronts Taya um, about kind of her state of mind and, and what she's feeling and the fact that she, their marriage isn't really working and that he knows she's cheating on him with Sebastian and all that kind of stuff. And for me that scene was kind of really jarring because of how it all came together and she's in front of a mirror in her dressing room and she's wearing this absurd clown makeup, which I really didn't expect because during the whole film, even though they're performances were always referenced, we never really had an indication of what kind of theater they did or what kind of performances they did. And I certainly didn't expect her to be in this this clown getup. So you don't know whether it's humor or dark humor or, or what it's doing. And it was very um, reminiscent to me of, of two previous films that I really enjoyed. And one was uh, Sawdust and Tinsel, and the other was Summer Interlude. Sawdust and Tinsel in that there's the humiliation of a clown uh, in, in one scene. Mm -hmm. And then Summer Interlude, where the actress is scrubbing off her makeup. But in Summer Interlude, where she is taking up her makeup in front of the mirror, it's a very self-reflective film, literally, because she's in front of a mirror. But she also comes to discover um, really big truths about herself and her past and her life, and it helps her to move forward as a human being. In this film, everything is just absurd. And... I found that really amusing, really entertaining. And the one thing to note, the difference between the two, is that she doesn't get her makeup off in the right. No, she just keeps smudging it further and further and, and makes herself look crazier and crazier, which she is. <laughs> I think that was intentional. And how about that final performance that we've been waiting about an hour to watch? We finally do get to see it at the end, and it is very strange and maybe a little bit shocking. Yes, but I would tend to think that most of the film that came before for it is significantly more so. Mm, okay. I, I think that's actually, that was an interesting and, and playful juxtaposition that he did where throughout the whole film he made us wait for this really alarming and offensive and hyper-sexualized performance, pornographic. Um, and then when he does show it, I mean, aside from two enlarged wooden penises and a little bit of exposed breasts, which actually look kind of tasteful, there's really not that much to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but all of the other scenes throughout the film, I mean, we have like sexual intercourse, we have references to rape. Orgasm. We have, yeah, a very, very graphic description of, of making a woman orgasm, which I've never seen in film before described quite like that. Um, it, it's a lot more jarring than anything that he shows us in that mock performance. To me, what Bergman is really addressing here is the point that the art of the film is not really the issue. In fact, everything that comes before it is more deviant, is more hurtful, is perhaps more offensive than the actual stage production, which are the officials and the critics are so distracted by. But that said, it's actually this art that seems to work as a weapon because it kills Mr. Abrahamson. He has a heart attack and dies um, during the performance. So that's a little bit of Bergman's dark humor, I think. The television medium also allowed Bergman to make this a little bit shorter than his other films, at just over 70 minutes. I'm sure that's a true fact, but it certainly didn't feel that short. It actually felt as long as some of his other movies. That's a good point. It dragged on at some point. <laughs> yeah, some I don't scenes. know whether it was that we kept waiting. Maybe it was the fact that he kept dangling this final scene in front of us and we just kept waiting and waiting and waiting for it and it never came until the very, very end. Or whether it was the pacing or... or the unanswered whatever. questions for me just yeah. frustrated me and distracted me from the progression of the story. Yeah, it's, it's almost like we kept waiting for this movie to grow up and just it never did. Um, it just kept getting left off and left off and, and pushed on to the next scene. And even the ending is so open-ended, if you will. And okay, so a lot of Bergman films are open-ended, but this one, just more graphically so. I think that I already know what your answer for this is, but Essential Bergman, is the right? No. I don't think so either. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that we've already made our case on this one. It's a frustrating film, and 
not in the ways that I would want to revisit. Nor is it one that I think you'd really gain a lot from watching multiple times or really overthinking. Bergman has also put it on the record several times that he's not a huge fan of the right either. He sees a lot of the weaknesses in the film, so we're not alone. You get a pass. That brings us to the end of this episode of Breaking Down Bergman. Be sure to join us next time when we will be looking at The Passion of Anna. And in the meantime, be sure to like us on Facebook. Or subscribe to our channel. And we will see you next time on Breaking Down Bergman.